Today, we got a photo booth. You probably saw it out in the lobby as you came in. And if you'd like to get your picture taken with your family, moms, it's a nice place uh, to do that. Very professional looking uh, situation out there. And if you're not with your mom, maybe you'd like to have a picture taken of yourself that you could send to mom today with your personalized greeting. So, happy, happy Mother's Day. I wonder what, uh, how Jesus celebrated Mother's Day with his mom. I wonder if he took his allowance and bought her a box of chocolates and made her a homemade card or something. Probably not. But we do see a nice relationship between Jesus and his mom. Of course, the miraculous circumstances behind his birth in the first place would have really brought them together in an amazing way as he was growing up. We get one little look at him. It's recorded in Luke's history of Jesus when he was a kid. He was 12 years old, and his family was in Jerusalem celebrating Passover, and somehow he wandered off to the temple and got very distracted, and the family left thinking he was in the caravan somewhere. So his mother was quite distraught when they discovered halfway home that Jesus wasn't with them. But they got all that worked out finally. Then when Jesus began his ministry, his mom encouraged him to perform a miracle that didn't seem like he was quite ready to do, but he went ahead and did it just, I suppose, because mom asked him to. And then, of course, at the end of his ministry, as he was dying on the cross, Mary was there and watched her son die. What would that have have been like for her? Well, as a mom, you can kind of imagine how she would have felt. And then she's in the band of followers there after Jesus resurrected. She wasn't one of the initial witnesses of that, but as the church was gathered in Jerusalem, after Jesus ascended to heaven, she's there, Mary And Jesus' brothers are there, and they're all in. They are believers. But that wasn't always the case. We get a look at his family dynamic early on in his ministry here in Mark's gospel where we are reading. And we see that first they were dubious. Even though there were these miraculous circumstances around his birth, his mother and his brothers went to bring him home, thinking that he had gone off the deep end with uh, some of the way he was conducting himself. And we'll get to that in a minute. But I want to move through these chapters of Mark, uh, first of all, at kind of a 20,000-foot perspective because, you know, Mark, as, as I said last week, Mark moves fast through these events in Jesus' life. So every chapter is full of three or four or five things that happen. Boom, 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 boom. And you could probably preach all of them if we wanted to stay in Mark until this time next year, but I don't want to ignore those things either. So before we get to Jesus' perspective on family and even Mother's Day, first of all, in chapter 3, we see that he's in the synagogue. So it's the Sabbath day, and there was a man there in the synagogue who had a hand that was deformed in some way. It didn't work. And so the enemies of Jesus did what they always did. They were watching him to see what he would do, to see if he would heal on the the Sabbath, on this day set aside for worship to God, because they considered an act of healing to be labor. That would be doing work on the Sabbath day, and they could indict him for that. And so Jesus said to them, so is it lawful, according to the law of Moses, is it lawful to do good or do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? And they didn't say anything. Nobody was saying anything. It was, let's see what he does. And so, after looking around them with anger, he was angry at the hardness of their heart. He proceeded to heal the man. He refused to be bound by their legalism that was dishonoring God and was disregarding human need that was right there in front of them when he had the power to do something about it. God becomes angry. That's what we see from Jesus here. God becomes angry when we allow rule-keeping to stand in the way or even going beyond the commands of God, extrapolating those out to the point that they hurt people. And so Jesus said, I'm not going to be bound by that. And he healed the man. And those leaders went right out and began to plot 
how they could stop Jesus, how they could even put him to death. That's how far they wanted to go. Well, in verses 7 through 12, because of Jesus' healing ministry, touching people's lives, delivering people from demonic possession, you can imagine he got quite a following, even though there were those who were against him. There were a lot of people at this point that were for him, and the crowds got so big that Jesus said to his men, to his inner circle, he said, you need to get a boat ready here on the Sea of Galilee. We may need to keep from being overwhelmed by this crush of people and get in a boat and uh, float to the other side. And then in verses 13 through 18, it says that he went to a high place. Some might say a mountain, a place where he could kind of get away from the crowds. And he officially, formally selected the 12 men who would join him in bringing the kingdom of God to earth through his ministry. And in the process, would make it possible for the people of earth to, to then go to heaven and be with God eternally. These were his men, the foundation of his kingdom, 12 men. In the same way that Jacob had 12 sons who became the physical nation of Israel, these 12 men became the foundation of the eternal kingdom of God as it was established here on earth. And he made some interesting selections because he didn't choose the likely ones. He chose men who were uneducated, apparently. Maybe, at least at that point, maybe couldn't even read or write all of them. We don't know for sure. There was one that we saw last week who was working for the Roman government. The Jews would have considered him to be a, a, a turncoat, a traitor of the worst kind, Matthew, the tax collector. He became one of the band of Jesus. And along with him then, Simon the Zealot. Well, a zealot was a revolutionary. A zealot was a group. The zealots were people who had dedicated themselves to taking down the Roman oppression, to doing away with the Romans, driving them out of their land. Romans considered zealots, these zealots, to be terrorists. Well, how did Simon and Matthew get along in this group? Well, I'm sure they had to work it out, probably. And even Judas, the betrayer of Jesus, was given the power initially to heal and to cast out demons, and he did some preaching. So right at the beginning, he might have been all in with Jesus before, before he went dark. But those are the 12 that Jesus selected. And then we see some of the perceptions of Jesus. First of all, his family. As I alluded to before, his family thought he was out of his mind. Jesus entered a house and a, and a big crowd gathered. His, he and his disciples couldn't even sit down and have a meal. There were just people always coming at them. So, so needy, so desperate to have Jesus touch and help them. So when his family heard about this, it says they went to take charge of him. And they went to, to bring him home because they said he is out of his mind. <laughs> our son, my son, our brother Jesus has become delusional. So they went to bring him home. Well, the religious rulers had another perspective on Jesus. They declared him to be in league with Satan. And told people so. The scribes, the scribes were the ones who were experts in the law of Moses. They came from Jerusalem. And they were saying, yeah, this is one who's possessed by Beelzebul. That's just another name for the devil. And he cast out demons by the ruler of the demons. Well, Jesus, first of all, points out the, the illogic of that. He said, Satan doesn't go around defeating himself. How much sense does that make? But beyond a lesson in logic... He says, when you say such things about me, you are in great danger of committing a sin that can't be forgiven. It's the unpardonable sin. He says, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. And it's because they were saying he has an unclean spirit that gives him the power to do these things. You know, as a kid, I used to worry. I'd, I'd read or hear about the unpardonable sin, the unforgivable sin, and I would worry that maybe I had committed that and I didn't know it because I wasn't sure what it was. I don't know, did you, did you ever wrestle with that? Oh, have I done that one and didn't, didn't know it? I'm doomed? Well, Jesus explains completely what that is. You see, these ones who were claiming that he was under the power of Satan, these weren't curious seekers after Jesus. They weren't honest doubters. 
It's okay to have honest doubts about Jesus, and there are questions that you want and need to have answered about him before you decide to follow him. That's not the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is when you know, when you have every reason to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And these people did, especially these rulers, these religious rulers, because they knew the truth of God through the Scriptures backwards and forwards. They had most of it or all of it memorized. As far as how far head knowledge can take you in comprehending Jesus, they had all they could hold. And they were observing miracles that only God himself could do. And still, they looked Jesus in the eye and they said, you are the devil. And they told other people that same thing. They were doing everything they could to neutralize Jesus. So, unless you are out spreading lies about Jesus and trying your best to turn people against him, when in your heart you know he's the Son of God, unless you're doing that, you're fine. (laughs) You are not committing the unpardonable sin. Well then, at the end of the chapter here, we find that Jesus' family comes looking for him again to bring their deranged son home with them so he can calm down. Jesus' mother And brothers arrive, and they're standing outside, and they sent someone in to call him. And there was a crowd that was sitting around him, and they told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside, and they're looking for you. And Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? And he looked at those who were seated in the circle around him. He probably gestured like this, and he said, here are my mothers and my brothers. Because whoever does God's will, whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. He responds to his family standing outside in kind of a cold fashion, doesn't he? You'd think he might run outside to greet them, to say hello. But he stays put. And instead, he makes a statement as to who it is that has a genuine connection and relationship with him, a connection that supersedes biological birth. He says, my family, my true family, are the people who understand and who do the will of God. And of course, the biggest part of that, or at least the beginning part of that, is to determine that a person is going to follow Jesus. Because that's how we understand the will of God, and that's how we come into relationship with God through Jesus. You know, even if you don't have, today on Mother's Day, people have all kinds of sentiments and feelings about Mother's Day. For some, and maybe for most, it's really good. You've got these warm, fuzzy uh, feelings about, about your mom and about your home and about your family, or if you're a mom, about your kids. It's it's all good, but not everybody has that. Some people don't have anybody. We've got some people here at Parkside who don't have anybody as far as a biological family. So Mother's Day can be kind of a, kind of points out your loneliness. There are others who just have families that aren't what they ought to be. We call those dysfunctional. People aren't treating each other right. They aren't able to to express love and affection and concern for each other. Home isn't a good place. There are people who are in that situation. And so a a takeaway from what Jesus says here for you, if you were in that situation this morning, is you still have a family. If you're with God in Christ, Jesus is saying to you, if you're following me, if you love me, you're in my family. You are my mother or my father or my brother or or my sister. He, He uses terms that we can relate to. You belong to me and I belong to you. We're together in a wonderful family with all the love, the affirmation, the acceptance, the rights, the privileges, the inheritance, the responsibilities, everything that goes with family. All of that is yours because you belong to me. And I hope that gives you some level of of assurance and and some level of comfort today as you understand that. And hopefully, 
A person without family, as they come to Christ and as they come into a church family, you find family here, here at Parkside. People who do love you and who look after you and, and accept you for who you are in Christ and affirm you and encourage you and pray for you. All the things that good families do. I hope and pray that is your experience here at Parkside. It's how a church family should function. But it's also good for biological families to consider what it means, what, what Jesus is saying here, for a family, a biological family, or whatever the, the makeup of your family is, these people that come together under the roof of your house, <laughs> whatever that configuration is, what it means for that gathering of people to be living within the will of God. You can have a, a great, a good family without knowing anything about God or anything about Jesus. Just by common sense and what you know to be true and right and good, you can have a good family. You can. But if you bring the will of God into the center of that, you can have not just a good family, you can have the best possible family, a really great family, because God just enhances it that much. And so what I want to do is take, I sat down with staff this week in our meeting on Tuesday, and I said, what would you say it takes for a family to understand and to live within the will of God? What are some very practical things that I could share, things that we can do to be families living within the will of God so that Jesus would say, yes, there's my mother and my brothers and my sisters. They get it. They understand what it means to live according to my, my priorities. And so we, we had a good time talking about all of that. So some of this is what staff shared. Some of it is just from my life experience. And I'm going to try and make this so that, first of all, you don't misunderstand that somehow we have perfect families <laughs> because we don't. But also don't want to, I don't know, set some unreasonably high bar so that it's like Ward and, Jean, Ward and June Cleaver with Jesus thrown in and you're going, well, I just forget it. There's no way we can even begin to get to that point within our family. I'm going to try and make this as real world as I can and, and things that are doable for anybody and everybody. So, you know any weird families? Anybody you consider to be weird? I, I don't suggest doing this, but I went to, uh, to Google. I Googled weird families. And uh, so here, here's some things that I found Here's one. This might be the perfect picture of what it means to say that the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. That's one family. Here's another family. I don't know. This, this might be the, uh, the holiday card that they put together, but nothing says Merry Christmas like primates in your, your Christmas picture. And then here's one. I couldn't even get to sleep after I saw this yesterday. Uh, I have no idea what that's about. We all know weird families. You know, you get behind a family in the grocery store. Do you ever do this? You're behind somebody and you're looking in their grocery cart going, I cannot believe they eat that. That's just weird. We, we think that uh, we're the normal ones. And then we find out even, I, I, found out when, uh, <laughs> I found out when I got married going, my family's more weird than I realized. Uh, <laughs> when you get a different template laid over it. But good, but, you know, some quirkiness there. Okay, here's what weird families do. Here's what weird godly families do, all right, that kind of go against maybe some of the norms. First of all, within a weird family, your family will hear you speak of the reality of God. As we understand the will of God and we're stepping into that, weird families <laughs> talk about God at home, in the house, around the table or in the family room. And especially, I don't know how many younger parents we have here this morning, but kids need to hear their moms and dads talk about their relationship with God. How do you feel about God? How is he real in your life? What kind of a difference is he making? Kids need to hear that. I, I would encourage young parents to not leave it to the subcontractors here at Parkside for all of the spiritual input into your kids' lives. Yes, we have wonderful people here in children's ministry and student ministry who pour everything they can into your kids as far as goodness and godliness and what they know of Jesus. But it's not enough because you are the biggest voice in your kids' lives, especially when they're little. 
And they consider you to be the most important person in their lives. And so they need to hear those things from you. Who is God? How do you know there is a God? And how is he real to you? What does he mean to you? How is he making a difference to you? And do it when they're young. And you might say, oh, great. Now my kids are old. Or my kids are gone now. Well, okay, I'm talking to parents with younger kids right now. Do it when they're young, and it's easier then to continue those conversations as they get older, when it's just a natural part of how you talk and converse in your home. Read the Bible together. Pray together. Let your family see you reading the Bible and praying. Hear you reading the Bible and praying. Not as some kind of posturing, but it, just in the reality of your life that this is what you do as a person who understands the will of God. That's how we apprehend the will of God. We read what he has to say to us in his word. We used to, I would do that with our kids when they were little. And I don't know what it was about sitting down reading the Bible before bedtime, but especially with the boys, something about that would just crack them up. They would get the giggles every time we would read the Bible. And I, I tried to stay chilled about that and not, you know, get all authoritative and upset. Uh, but I remember one time we were, we were reading through Genesis, and I, we came to a story there, uh, Judah and Tamar. If you're familiar with that story at all, that is not appropriate for little children yet anyway. So I came to that, I was going, um, okay, and I flipped the page. Suddenly, especially the boys, were very astute Bible students. What? What's in there you can't read? Why, what story is that? So uh, I had to kind of dance around, around that one. But yeah, s start young. Start early with kids and just make it a, the natural flow of life in your home. Weird families are an oasis of the grace of God. As Christ loves us unconditionally, family members understand that kind of love through the unconditional love that we extend to each other in our homes. Any kind of a critical word that's offered at home, and sometimes there has to be those. You know, if homework doesn't get done or chores aren't accomplished, you know, you have to, to get after some of those things. But any critical word should be balanced by tons of affirmation and love and acceptance. And I'm not talking about phony praise, you know, Oh, you're the best there ever was. Oh, that's the best picture that anybody ever drew. Oh, you're, the, you know, the greatest, the greatest, the greatest. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about letting our family members know, whether it's our kids or our spouses or whoever happens to live under our roof with us, to say to them, I am crazy about you just because you are a part of my family, just because you are who you are. That's why. To say to them, I need nothing beyond anything that is true of you right now in order to cherish you fully. Nothing you do could make me love you more than what I love you right now. That's what we need to hear from each other because that's the love of Jesus. Home needs to be a place where we encourage each other, support each other, laugh with each other. It needs to be a haven from all the hurtful, mean stuff that goes on outside the home, where we work and where we go to school and in the neighborhood. Home is the place where we can get away from all that and find the love of Jesus. Yeah. Weird couples, weird husbands and wives act like Jesus toward each other. Now, this is Paul who wrote this in Ephesians 5 but uh, makes it just as credible and just as authoritative. He says that, Husbands, you need to love your wives as Christ loves you. And wives, you need to honor and respect your husband in the same way that we honor and respect Christ as the church. That is revolutionary stuff for husbands and wives to come together in that way. And don't wait on the other one to make the first move in outdoing one another, in showing honor to one another in the home as husbands and wives. You know, I did a wedding here. Um, Tracy and Larry, I'm going to call you out here, okay? I, I was going to write to you and ask you if I could do this. Is it okay if I do this? 
Okay, I can do this. Uh, did a wedding for Tracy and Larry. Newlywed sitting right here. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Fields now. And as a part of their ceremony, I, I had never seen this in a wedding ceremony. They got down on their hands and knees on the stage and they washed each other's feet. And we tied that in with, of course, what Jesus did for his disciples on the night just before he went to the cross. And what a, a wonderful picture that is of what Jesus says, yes, this is how a home works best. This is how a marriage works. This is how a home works best when we are willing to do whatever it takes to demonstrate love and care and to say, I'm going to make you successful. I'm going to make you happy and fulfilled, whatever it takes, even if it means getting down on my hands and knees and washing your feet, that is what I will do. What, what a wonderful picture that was that day for all the people that were gathered there to, to be a part of your wedding. This was one that... Uh, I thought was really good. Create a home that your kids want to come home to. You know, I did a, a funeral not too long ago for a family. It was for the mom that had passed away. The father had died about a year before. And these, these kids, these adult children, a little younger than me, went on and on. They were having the best time describing their home that this was the place that everybody wanted to come to. When they were in high school, all their friends wanted to come to their house because their parents were so open and so inviting. There was always a lot of food. They had pinball machines in their basement, and their friends would say, your mom and dad are so cool. This is the place we want to be. So make your home the place, if not all the neighborhood kids or all the kids from the high school, at least for your kids, the place that your kids want to come home to. That's, that's a wonderful goal. Lots of food, lots of fun. Again, that oasis of the grace of God. Erect no idols. An idol is anything that you love more than you love God or is more important to you than what God is. So, Whatever message we send to our family members in that way through our lives, that's what they're going to carry away with them from the home out into the world, especially with kids. Whatever message we send, that's the one they will leave home with. If God is constantly taking a back seat to work, to athletics, to social obligations, other pursuits, if God is invisible in the home outside of some kind of a, a Sunday experience, don't be surprised if God is in the back seat or left behind entirely when kids leave home. And we have to ask, what, what priority in our, in our homes, what priority is even the simple thing of, of the Sunday gathering, su Sunday worship? What supersedes that? Again, going back to our family, if you don't mind me using some personal experiences a little bit. And let me assure you, we did not have the perfect family. I was not the perfect father. My kids were fortunate to have my wife <laughs> as, as their mother, uh, as uh, he showered the grace of God into our family through her in a huge way. So we weren't the perfect family, all right? But it was, it was very important to us and to me that we establish that being here in a gathering like this is, is very important. You obviously think that or you wouldn't be here. This morning. And it came up, uh, I think Lucas was in the sixth grade and had a chance to go to space camp. And so this was going to require that he wasn't going to be with us on a Sunday. They had to leave on a very early Sunday morning to go to Huntsville, Alabama to space camp. Well, this was a family dilemma, a family crisis, probably more for me <laughs> than anybody else in the family. But I said, okay, we got, we got to do something to establish what a priority is here. So I said, okay, Saturday night we're going to have a little worship service and we're going to have communion together before you leave early Sunday morning. Okay, that's all we'll do. So as I'm putting all this together, I discovered I didn't have, we didn't have any grape juice. I thought, okay, so what am I going to do? It was too late to go get any grape juice. So we happened to have apple juice. And I thought, well, okay, I'll just put a little red food coloring in the apple juice, and it'll look pretty much like grape juice, and that's what we'll have. So we're going through, you know, reading the Bible and doing our little thing, and we come to the point where we're taking the communion, and the kids, they drink this, not sure what it looked like, but anyway, they drank it, and they, and they all but spit it out of their mouths across the table, like, what is this? And it wasn't that it tasted so bad, it just didn't taste like what it looked like, and it was kind of mysterious, and so it certainly wasn't grape juice. 
Well, that just kind of brought the whole worship service to a grinding halt. And uh, they would just went on and on. What were you thinking, Dad? I don't know how much we established reverence for God at that point, but that is a memory that our kids still carry with them, the, the communion service with the, uh, the red dye apple juice that night. But hopefully it made some kind of a point that, you know what, worshiping God is really important, and we don't want to just brush that off as something we forget about because something else came up. So, however we live out our life with God in our home, our morals, our ethics, those become the moral and ethics of our kids to a great extent. Our language becomes theirs, how much we're involved in the Bible and prayer, how we treat each other and speak to each other within the home, they carry that away. How we speak to and treat each other people outside the home, people, especially people who are different than us, people who are racially different than us, economically different than us, educationally different than what we are, how we talk to people, service people, how we get on the phone and deal with some kind of an issue with a product or service that wasn't satisfactory, how do they hear us speaking to people in those situations? Kids are like little Roombas going around the home, picking up anything and everything as far as values, demeanor, ethics, honesty. They pick it all up. Now, now sometimes they sort through that, and they're able to keep what's good and discard what isn't, but they pick all of it up, and they take it with them, and they leave home with that. And so families who are living within the will of God understand that. Families who live within the will of God are often considered to be weird because it goes against the grain somewhat of what the culture and society says is normal. Here is how families should function, culture says. Here is how they should live. And when I was growing up, there were times when it became very obvious to me that we didn't do things that other families did. Some of that was economic. I didn't understand that so well at the time. I do now. <laughs> but it wasn't all that, and my parents never made an issue of that. I would say, well, why can't we do this, and why can't we do that? And my dad would say, we're just different. Now, he didn't say that in a judgmental way, to say they are bad and we are good. I never heard that kind of talk. It's just we're different. We live differently. And I, I'll be honest, I didn't like that as a kid. I didn't want to be different. I wanted to do those things that other families did. But as time progressed and as I got older, I understand that, that was really very good and worked out very well in our home and in my life and then what I carried into my family as I got married and had children. We were just different because mom and dad were very focused on God's priorities and God's values. And yeah, we weren't shut off from everybody around us or the world around us. We participated in all of the good things in the society and in the culture that you can and you should participate in. But then there were lines drawn with those things that just weren't a part of our lives. Dare to be weird. <laughs> Dare to be weird. Weird families eat together. Try to avoid meals on the run. Try to avoid eating meals in the van if you can. And sometimes you can't. This can be avoided. Don't eat meals in front of the television. Don't do that. Turn off the electronics when you're eating meals. But sit around a table together and look at each other and converse with each other. And connect because meal times are a wonderful time when that can happen. And it doesn't have to be a gourmet meal. It can be DiGiorno's pizza in the microwave. But carve out that time to be together, eat together, talk together, and share life together. So important. And that was a monster priority that my wife set. And it didn't matter even when the kids were in high school and they were off. They did, sometimes they didn't get home from practices until 7, 8, 8.30, 9 o'clock sometimes. That's when we ate because we were going to sit down at the table and we were going to have a meal together. And to this day, one of the favorite gathering places of our family is the kitchen 
and around the table, and that's when all the talk and all the laugh and all the sharing of memories, so many good things happen around the meal. That's how Jesus was. As you look through the history of Jesus, some of the best times with his followers and some of his most poignant teachings come out of those times that he was sitting down at a meal with people. When people are slowing down, when they can stop, when they can focus, all the outside distractions are gone, and he would step in and he would say something so important to them. And of course, the time that that happened in the most dramatic fashion is when he hosted the meal for his disciples, for these 12 men that he selected that we read about here in Mark 3. He was with them at Passover time, and he was the host He was the founder, the father of that Passover feast that night. And he gave special meaning to that meal. It was a communion time. And he took the bread and the wine and he said, this has such significance because this is my body and my blood. I'm about to be sacrificed for you. I'm about to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And so as you partake of this in this meal and as this meal goes forward into time, understand the weight and the gravity of this meal and what it means because it means life to you. Not just the meal itself, but what the meal means because it means that God himself loved you enough to die for you. And as you take him into your life, as you consume bread and wine, as you take Jesus into your life and receive him, That's when we come into the will of God. And Jesus says, behold, my family. Yes, my brothers, my sisters, the sons and daughters of God. That's what we become when we take the life of Jesus into ourselves. And so we're going to share in this meal, this family meal together. As the family of the people of Parkside, as the family of the gathered believers of Christ. And some of you may not yet be there yet, but you can ponder and think about this as we observe this meal But it's a time to also understand that we are the family of God, that he is our father, that Jesus Christ is our Messiah, our Savior, our Lord, and even our brother. That's what this meal is about. So we invite you to partake. If you understand that, if you have received Christ into your heart and your life, we invite you to share in this meal as it comes around. But first, we're going to sing together, address God through song, and then we'll sit down and share together. Let's stand.